Welcome to Inner TV. I'm your host, Althea Provost. My guest is fellow Starseed and writer Laura Marjorie Miller. In this interview, we'll explore her newly published ebook, The Flagrant Joys of Solo Travel, and explore Woo-hoo. all things Starseed. Laura Marjorie Miller is a writer and explorer. She has danced with wild dolphins in Bimini and Kona, gotten mauled by a Cadigan, had her shoes stolen <laughs> by fairies in Ireland been turned into a vine in Peru, and snorkeled with humpback whales in Newfoundland, among other escapades. As a freelance writer, her work has been published in several media outlets from Fairy Magazine to Boston Globe. Her first ebook, The Flagrant Joys of Solo Travel, has been listed on Amazon as a number one self-help and travel short read. Laura believes in traveling with one's whole body as a creative act and as an act of personal and planetary renewal. Welcome, Laura, to Inner TV. I'm so excited to get to do an interview with you, Althea. I love your show. And, yes, this is a real privilege. (laughs) Thank you so much for agreeing. It's nice to have a sis on here and to have this moment. Congratulations on your first e-book. Yeah, this was a big breakthrough for me. I had been wanting to do a book for a little while and not really knowing, you know, what form that was going to take. Some of the story of the e-book was that, Earlier this year, I've been working really hard on a book proposal and putting together a book and sending out a proposal to get it agented and published through a traditional route. And it was a different book, just kind of hitting a wall. And I got really disheartened. But then I had this other book come through that was a little fleeter and more streamlined and more immediately of service. Another friend and counselor of mine, Ava Marquez, I had a session with her and she said, well, why don't you do an ebook? And for some reason, all of a sudden it was very easy. All the blocks that I had encountered, basically calling upon other people to approve me and all these things were released. And then I could create a book and I created this compact and really dear little book. I'm really excited about it. It came through exactly the way it wanted to come through in this moment. What are the flagrant joys of solo travel? Another thing that came through was that the title came through all at once (laughs) because I had, I didn't know what I was going to title it. And one day that title just popped into my mind and that was the title. And I just knew it was the title. Flagrant is a word that we don't, we use in a sense of brazenness of just something that's just really out there and, and in your face and unapologetic. Some of that self, quality of just indulging your senses and participating fully with all of your senses in in the ride that you're in um, and immersing yourself in an experience really without holding back. And one of the reasons that it's important that it's solo travel is that, and it comes through in the book, is that as much as I love other human beings, <laughs> sometimes interacting with them can pull some parts of us back from where we are because we're checking ourselves against them or they're influencing us or we're kind of paying attention to them in some little way that triangulate our relationship with earth and the relationship with the place on earth where we are. So that's why, and it's just sort of, it's uninhibitedly giving yourself into the place and the experience that you're in as yourself. And I loved how you started your book with codependency. And your quote was, cuddle up and be my little clinging vine. I love that. I love that because on some level, that's exactly what we're doing. We're clinging to somebody else, whether it's their problems and keeping ourselves from that deep presence of what it is that wants to be birthed through us and Mm -hmm. in us you know, with us, with the environment that we're in, and brought me right back to my very first solo travel trip back in 2004 to New Zealand, and when Spirit called me forth. And I honestly, having read your book, enjoyed it on an airplane, which was fitting, it brought me Mm -hmm. back to that moment. Would I have had that level of impact and opening had I looked Mm -hmm. to a girlfriend or my husband at the time, or my family Mm -hmm. to come with me. And I know I would not have because that deep 
inner work, connecting to what the divine wanted to show me, or as you would say in your book, Earth would want to show mm-hmm. me, Gaia herself, mm-hmm. really yeah. required that I be stripped of the need to be validating and validated. Right. And that came through through your work. That's great. Like, I'm I'm excited. One thing that has been coming through whenever um, people give me responses to the book, it's interesting how different people interact with the book and how it makes them reflect on things, the way they've done things in the past or a possibility of the way that they want to do things in the future. So I'm really happy because that's what the book was supposed to meant to do that it was a book of service that would actually not just be about me but would be about the person who was reading it and like the clinging vine is from an old song and I think that's the name of it (laughs) it's an old song from like the 30s or 40s and it's a love song it's such a weird thing to say to somebody because why would you want to be somebody's clinging vine (laughs) like I don't know and and I contrasted it of course later in the book with the ayahuasca vine, which is a vine, but basically, you know, clings in inside clings to no one except for the earth itself. And actually that title was ayahuasca, not a clinging vine. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not a clinging vine. Absolutely not. It's this fiercely, beautifully independent, sassy vine that's like deeply wise and my experience of of it, of her, of me grafted with it is was also very, very in, just almost insanely funny, where you can see like deep down into things and but but mirthful, joyous, everything. It was great. So it's something that in that assurance of you don't need to cling on to anybody there's this amazing consciousness of earth because I wanted the book also to be of service to earth. And um, which is why I use, you know, just asserting over and over again, like earth, Earth, this is for earth. Um, Yeah. So I'd like to share with our starseed audience, a quote uh, from your book. It said, I found this way through solo travel. I healed myself through solo travel and by being alone with her I allowed the earth and all her wonders to heal me and through the projects I set forth to do to speak for her I healed myself and the earth healed me because I learned and I relearned through being with her to love myself I also was reminded of how much fun I love this glorious planet yeah oh wow (laughs) I do and I I it's for star seeds too I mean, we're everything we're going through right now in in this moment on the timeline. Um, I think a lot of people feel kind of confused and conflicted about the relationship with Earth because you you know on some levels we feel this great sorrow for what we're you know what humans are doing to Earth. There's this part of people in I guess that wants to identify with their in star seeds, like this extra planetary galactic self that, um, and, and it's nice, I think, essential to interweave earth as part of the galaxy. And as this, this um, just amazing life source planet that has so much going on and it's really exciting to be on and, and intricate and oh, gosh, just so complex and fascinating and beautiful. And um, I think sometimes the, the, I guess the conflicts we have about being on earth aren't really conflicts with the earth as an, as a natural being, but a lot of the, you know, problems of human culture and things like that. And, um, but earth really needs, requires, earth is going to be fine. You know, she's going to outlive all of us individually but for us right now in our embodiment to um to establish our own relationship with earth and that we'll be able to fully fulfill our embodiment on her now 
if that makes sense. And I agree with you. I think having a personal relationship with the earth is key because we are her and she is us. Mm -hmm. So it isn't Mm -hmm. a simple split. It isn't I'm upon her for a temporary ride. As we go deeper and deeper within our own inner connection, we become that bond and we feel that bond. So it is a stressful time in terms of where she's at and, you know, what's being placed upon her. It's not an easy read Mm -hmm. to look out there and see what's happening. But at the same time, we hold steady. And I liked what you wrote in CODA on earth, religion, and humanity in your chapter. You said, earth is trying to seduce you so badly that you can't hear it. It, I use it, and she somewhat interchangeably, is romancing you with the utmost yearning. It is giving you everything. That love you have yearned for since childhood. It is right there. It is a romance. It is so sexy. It is sexy. And, um, yeah, wow, that's really nice to hear that read back to me. <laughs> I hear it in my own you, voice. Darling. In my... <laughs> well, you're in that moment, so I don't want to pull you out of it. But I, I, I want to mm-hmm. take you to 2015, I think it was. Mm-hmm. I was in South France southwest france and it's very rural extremely beautiful and i was driving a million miles an hour in this bmw uh, which i shouldn't have been but i was it was you know back roads no one was around and all of a sudden time slowed down slowed down to the point that when i was watching the cows come down the hill and the bell around their neck i can hear it ding ding and the swaying and i felt the sway of the earth work with the the animals where everything mm-hmm. became visceral and slow a tempo and i felt all of a sudden the earth and everything in a deep state of unity and mind you i'm driving fast and so i Mm. slowed down so that i could take this curb but even in my slowing down of the car i wasn't able to to slow it down enough to keep that moment it really just like almost saturated me and i had to continue driving but what i felt in that moment is the same thing that i feel about this earth and it's almost like if you slow down you see the magic of it you see the beauty of it and as you're in a solo travel moment because i've had many as have you you have that richness and that is what you are pointing to in your book yeah, absolutely. And I and you really you do have these trippy experiences and they're not really trip it's like they're not really trippy because they're the way things actually are. <laughs> Correct. Think, well, this is the way things are. The rest of the time we're tripping and it, <laughs> that's the trip, not this, you know, not these essential moments. But when you're alone and you can be alone for long enough, it always takes me like a day it's about a good day and I have to really downshift from, you know, traveling to being actually where I am. Um, but then things start to happen. And even if something extraordinary, you know, that's out, I guess, out of the normal doesn't happen, your perception being opened up is, is what's happening. And it takes being alone and, and, coming more into yourself that really allows that. And it's not, when I say it's, and it's in the book that you come into yourself, it's not a sense of isolation. It's just a a sense of coherence of, of who, who I am. And, And what's my relationship with, with earth and my surroundings. And those surroundings can be natural surroundings or they can even be the, you know, beautiful, um, created by, people surroundings like I have a great fondness and and this comes out in the book of like old neon motels that's like something I love whenever I go out west that's where I always try to stay even those in their man-madeness and you know their relative youth compared to the landscape around them are it's like I'm running out of words to describe they're exquisite and sweet and they're yearning for your full attention and um and when we're alone we can really give that and sometimes it takes getting off of, you know, or, or really toning down your um, connectivity through social media. As much as I love to communicate through social media, sometimes you really 
um, it helps to ha- be limited in that in some way. You know, you can't constantly be, be going and like checking in with other people for validation of your experience. I do sacred travel adventures and I've had those awakening experiences or their depths of awakening with group people. Once one starts to solidify within themselves, they can extend it within a group and have that solidarity within a group environment as well. But Mm -hmm. for women who are interested in traveling alone and feel the call and would enjoy your book as well as your wisdom, what are some of the practical advice that you could give them? You can start at any scale. If taking, um, you know, taking a big trip is daunting for you, you can start by extending your orbit outward from where you are. And a really early um, uh, article I wrote for a website called Got Saga was, was like my slightly metaphysical travel tips. That's still online. But one of the things I was like, get in a mindset of travel. And depending on what you can afford, it doesn't have to be a huge extravagant thing. It could be going to a place that you're curious about in, in, your county, your state, your you know locality, and doing it alone, and and taking trail hikes alone. It doesn't have to be a huge travel trip at the beginning. That's completely daunting. You can warm up to it, and I and as you get more and more warmed up to, you're okay. You know that you're going to be okay <laughs> alone. Then. You know, if if that's what it takes, you can gain more confidence um, in your own self sufficiency and also the Earth's sufficiency to to be up underneath you and to facilitate those things. And there's a there's a chapter in the book of, that's advice to women traveling alone, and it's more detailed in the in the chapter. But we can psych ourselves out a lot um, by not. I think assuming that we're going to be more isolated than we are and you, so it's like you're both alone and not alone. You're alone, but then there is also this support structure that, that will show up to help you. And one of the things that I write about in the book is that there's the network of women that I discovered one of my first on, it was actually my first solo road trip, and I was really scared. It wasn't supposed to happen that way. I had had a breakup with my boyfriend that I was supposed to go on this trip with, and but I really wanted to do the trip, and I wasn't. I had the yearning in me that I I wasn't going to wait for him. I was just like, I don't know if we're going to get back together. I don't I don't want to depend on his whimsies in order to do this trip. So I'm going to do it. But I was really scared. And what I discovered was places I went, the women in the places I went, if I would have a conversation with them and it would come out that I was traveling by myself, they would say things like, well, if you need anything, you come here. And that's not to say that, you know, you go and like immediately are all needy to other people on your trip, but that there might be... <laughs> There's this invisible network that is there to support you if you, you know, if you need it. Just like I say, if, if it was you and someone else was in your locality and you knew that about them, you would, you would help them. Well, not that to was, be true, even with my travels, uh, you know, for over a decade, I've had people say, why are you a woman traveling alone? You know, in various mm-hmm. languages, they would say that. But essentially, that was, why are you doing that? Yeah. And I used to say, yeah. because I can. <laughs> Let's right. start there. Right. And then secondly, it's because it's fun. Um, and I would leave my tennis shoes wherever I go to, especially in areas where women were in hills, to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Show women that this is an option for you as well if you so choose it. And what I liked about your premise is you said, learn what your intuition is. F social codes and use it. This is your life. Yes. There's one experience in the book, which was something that didn't happen, but it was an experience um, that was my intuition was just firing, like screaming at me that there was an unsafe person and I heeded it and I didn't care. And the person who I would have maybe been a couple of years before 
that happened would have been a lot more conflicted about making that decision, basically didn't give a person a ride. And the story came up when I was writing the book because I was like, I need another story here. And I had actually forgotten about it because it was in Ireland and my experience in Ireland was so positive and had so much else in it. When I remembered that that moment, and it was in a safe environment, but it was me making a decision on my own behalf was like, really listen to your intuition. And you have, you do have one life. This is your life. It's the most precious thing while you're in it and need to take care of it <laughs> and not feel bad about, you know, maybe seeming like an antisocial person if you, if you don't have a drink with someone or, or whatever. pleasing because you're not agreeing to somebody else's agenda that's not feeling right in, in your own intuitional body, which is what I love, because you're concretizing that giving personal power over to others is not your thing, period. Putting it on display, uh, mm -hmm. showing everyone your own mistakes, and saying, this is how I got to realize my own dreams, but these are the things that catch you up from doing that, at least from my perspective. What I wanted to do with those moments, because I, it would have been easy to say, oh, here's this person on the trip with me who's being awful, and what a horrible person, and, you know, how could he do that, and blah, blah, blah. But what I really wanted to do was to show why was I agreeing to that? Why was I abandoning myself in those moments? And what was going on inside me? Because we make those decisions before we learn better. We make those decisions a lot. And I, and I would reckon, especially as women, we're more socialized to make decisions like that, where you, you give over to someone and then you feel like resentful and weird at the best for the rest of the time. And, um, but that, but then later you think, well, why did I even do that? And it's better to take personal responsibility for your part in it and why, and really know why you did something that helps you get clear of it. You don't keep repeating that behavior. The maturity piece is when you realize you've got these programs running, socialization programs running within you, and these are your knee-jerk expressions that aren't serving you. The Open Road does for women especially is there's no longer somebody there saying you have to abide by those rules, you know, because they don't know you. They're not invested in you. And you're mm -hmm. just passing through. And so it gives you that opportunity to look at how you want to respond and be today. Yeah, it does clear out. I mean, travel is, it incredibly concentrates things in a way because you're not in the usual network of negotiations with all of the different interrelationships around you of work and of whatever your social communities are, church, all of these things. And you can really see like, what am I doing in this situation? It's almost, you know, like a, like a play where things are very distilled. And if you have something that's dysfunctional, you really see it. And if you, you <laughs> if you have something <laughs> like I'm in the hotel room with this person and this is screwed up and, and then <laughs> where's the exit? <laughs> right. Where is it? Okay. Can we just do this scene over? But that, yeah. So you really get to see that and you get, you know, if you make good decisions, then you get do overs and you can get better <laughs> if you don't give rides to <laughs> the wrong And you don't people. have to book the same hotel and show up a different way with somebody else and try to recreate the new, the new you. Just right. keep moving forward, ladies. We, you know, yes. let, let, like, let it be fun. Uh, learned... Take a turn to your star seatedness. Let's share with our star seat audience. How did you come to know that you were a star seed? I am so happy that you're using that word for me because I have started to get really interested in it probably the year before I became acquainted with you. And it was through, you know, following things from place to place, you know, like I start listening to one person on YouTube and then they talk about this other thing. And I, I was on this real curiosity line and I was following uh, Lauren Gailey's show because uh, Jamie Price, she was going to be on the show. And that's when I started listening to Lauren's show. And that's how I became acquainted with you. And I, it's like this thing that started to wake up in me 
to where I was more and more interested in things. And my it was really the way I learn anything in my life. And I think everybody's different in the way that they come into information. Like I was thinking about, you know, you being clairvoyant. I'm not necessarily clairvoyant. I'm more, I would say, clairsentient. If I had to say, like, I don't, I've never had like a vision of somebody right in front of me. <laughs> But it was just these knowings and things getting turned on in, in my mind. I started having emotional responses to things. So I would follow a thread where I was, say, reading about mantis beings. And I would think, oh, I love praying mantises. I want to read about mantis beings. And there would be something in it that would just move me so emotionally that I felt like a sense of poignancy it's like but it's also joyful it's happy it's not like a stricken longing it's it's just like this beautiful happy recognition and love then I started experimenting with channeling and with light language and and doing protocols in my meditation space where I would do light language and it would for me it was at the beginning it was gestural and I would close my eyes and I would see patterns emerging, I would see patterns and I would feel like my hands moving in ways that they sculpted uh, energy in, in the space around me. And sometimes in funny ways where I would be like, guys, my arm doesn't go all the way behind my back like that. Like I, have to, I would have to dislocate it to do what you're wanting me to do and shape, you know, do this shape. But when I was doing that, sometimes I would start to see at this point right now, not a full being, but I would get a sense of being's essence. I would see a part of a being. I would see like an eye or, you know, somebody's forelimb or something like that. And I would feel, I would feel them and I would see parts of them in my, in my mind's eye and my heart's eye. And that when that stuff started coming on online, I guess, I felt a lot more integrated. I had never felt disintegrated. I wasn't like running around through my life thinking, oh, I'm missing something, part of myself. It was just a deeper level of things that I had been experiencing. And it's exciting because it's like it, it keeps opening up and I keep and it keeps widening out in front of me. So I feel like I'm in this community all the time where I'm in this conversation with them a lot, you know, where I could just. I laugh or they show me something or, you know, synchronicity or something. And I talk to them and it's just, it's sweet and it is, it's joyful and loving. And I remember too, when I heard you for the first time on, on Lauren's show and you were talking about the gray Zetas and the way you talked about them was so beautiful and compassionate that I started crying when I was listening to it. And I knew that it was, you know, what you were talking about was real. The way I experienced being a star seed is through feeling. And it's like through this deep knowing of just something as a reality. And it's a, it's kind of like a non-negotiable reality that if I would know that if I, um, if I disregarded it, I would be almost like rubbing a cat's fur the wrong way. Like I would be like not doing something that, you know, I'd be going in the opposite direction of what I needed to go, if that makes sense. Exactly. And I love that about you, how you don't negate your own feelings, your own feeling body, which is leading to that richness, that fullness, that integration and experiencing that greater part of you and your team or, or the beings that are around you that want to work with you to help facilitate remembering. And the beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful part is, is you stick with it and more and more comes and, and you start to see the pattern. Oh, maybe my parents had ET experiences and you start uncovering all these little bits and pieces. They start unraveling traveling and flowering so that you can begin to see I've actually been in this energy longer than I thought. Yeah, it was funny over the last year and the timing of things being revealed to you. I think you're like, well, why didn't I know this before? Like, these are the same parents I've had. Why did they never tell me this before? Like, I found out over the last year just in two totally separate conversations with them. And I don't even know why we were talking about these are my blood parents. They've been divorced a really long time. So they don't even know this about each other that they had both had UFO experiences in totally different times, different, you know, different places in, in their life and timeline. 
And that just was so delightful to me <laughs> because I wondered, you know, I, I was like, what, what is going on with them? You know, <laughs> what, what, what is the, you know, the relationship with, with what they're seeing is their own relationship with it. And I just get a kick out of things like whenever I discover things that are sort of stereotypically ET in, in my life story, like that I have RH negative blood and so does my dad and nobody else in my family has it, none of my sisters. And, and I, 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 just, I just take a lot of delight in that, you know, whatever the deep truth of blood types is or that kind of thing. But it's fun and um, it gives a sense of, of kinship and um, novelty, I think. <laughs> and it keeps unfurling. Like, I've always wondered, why is it? Because this has been my experience, too. Like, when I saw Zayd on the side of the road, and I was with <laughs> an adult, you know, and, like, another, a, we were at a concert, another concert goer, and all of us saw it, pointed to it, and then we shut <laughs> up and never talked about it again. It's so funny, because that is common with people, with contactees or experiencers, because They'll never talk about it. And it's it's not until recently that people are just starting to say, hey, this is my experience. But mm -hmm. people would have an experience in 20, 30 years would go by, never even mentioned it. Their whole family can experience it, and they won't even say anything. I guess it's just different kinds of people, the different individual reasons people would keep something to them. This is global. Itself. It is a global pattern. Yeah, and it doesn't – I don't know. Like, there are things that have happened in my life that – I keep to myself simply because I know that they're really, really special. Yeah, I And do too. I would have to be, like, really with someone that I knew was – I don't even know. It would have to be a person who was sort of with me for my whole life, and I never had to worry – worry is not the right word, but I just knew that, that this information would be treasured by them mm. and, and that it would – it's just that, des that decision you make between what you tell and what you don't tell, mm -hmm. um, what's magical and what's, you know, what's magical kept and what's magical shared. And I wrote something about that in my book too, because you want to have, inf you want to have these experiences. You kind of know they're between you and earth, you and galactic, you and that being, I think there's a human impulse with some of us to run around and, and tell that stuff and capitalize on it in the moment. But then sometimes afterwards we can feel like, wow, I just gave that away. And now there's nothing, you know, <laughs> like, I gave it away too cheaply almost, or it wasn't, or that wasn't supposed to be shared. And I've become, so maybe some people make decisions based on that. But then there's the like other school of thought, right. which is if you share something, then it becomes part of people's reality. And they're like, wow, you know what? I saw that too, you know? Um, and I think that's just a decision you have to follow your own intuition about in the moment. You know? I also keep like, things for myself that I want to review in my passing years, like little tidbits that bring nothing but joy mm -hmm. to me. And for me, and for me alone, these are very special moments. And so they'll, they're not written down. They're in my heart. Right. And those are the ones that I keep to myself just for me. But there are yeah. other reasons that I share. And so I'm going to invite you into the hot seat so you can share with our <gasps> audience something personal that you really don't want to give away. Are you ready? Okay. Is this a particular <laughs> <You> mentioned, question? <laughs> yes, of course. Okay. You mentioned that writing the book was an act of self-love. As a paid yeah. freelance writer who is familiar with pitching writing projects for acceptance, the rejection process can be brutal. How has self-publishing this ebook affected you? It gave me a lot of confidence in myself I think for a long time and this was my personal story but other people might be able to relate to it making doing an ebook was a big decision for me because I had some residual snobbery from you know looking at people who were published by houses and who had agents and thinking like well I'm that good and or maybe I'm not that good or whatever but my stuff needs to be approved and by all these different uh, entities, right? But I realized in a way that I wasn't really telling myself the truth that I was using that to 
psych myself out. And then in a way that was a baffler over what was really going on was that I had, I had the means because self-publishing, and I just want to say that to everybody listening, anybody can make an ebook. It's really easy. That doesn't mean that it's cheap. That's empowering. You can go on Amazon, you know, you, they, they, they do every, they'll like walk you through all the steps to, formatting, pricing. You can go on Canva and make a beautiful cover and you can create a book and then you have a book that is to your name and authorship. That's my, not a sidebar, but that's an inclusion there. But I think I had this, this snobbery and it was a leftover from my time in academia of, well, if I do an ebook, that's like somehow too cheap and easy, right? Anybody can do that. Instead of saying, anybody can do that, that's great. It was, anybody can do that, and that makes it somehow less. But then I realized, and my act of self-love was me realizing that I was constantly going to other people and asking them to validate me. And, and of course, you want to do that, like if you're pitching magazine articles and things like that. But I was giving all of my power over to other people to authorize me, to make me an author, to authorize me. And I thought, well, wait, I can authorize myself. Do I, am I brave enough to make this book? I don't have anybody behind me to fall back on. I don't have anybody backing me up. So if I stick it out there and people scorn it, ignore it, whatever, that's all on me. So I dug up and unearthed that old you know, it was really deep seated fear where I had been fooling myself. And my realization was, why should I expect anybody else to, to publish me if I wasn't willing to publish myself? If I can't stand behind what I wrote, why would I expect somebody else to do that? And so that was where the message of the ebook and self publishing the ebook everything that was actually in the themes of the book itself came together in the fact that it was a self-published book because it was like, I have to do this for myself. I have to travel, like to travel by myself, to go through the process of publishing something and hanging it out there like a big matzo ball, just hanging out there for people to like accept their rejection. So that was the big, and so it was an act of self-love for me saying, I love myself enough to stand behind what I wrote on my own. Yeah, and go through the process of unveiling yourself over and over to other people who are interested in your work and to re-express it in ways that, and grow in ways that you wouldn't have had possible had you not put it out, right? Absolutely, yeah. But the book itself is really the solution to the puzzle and it, it's really learning to to love yourself enough to be willing to go it alone and then realizing of course that alone you're not really alone in the isolated alienated sense of being alone but having having enough love and confidence of yourself and the worth to what you bring to whatever experience you're having is enough it's enough you you're loved no matter where you go. Oh my gosh, I'm like feeling this as I'm saying this. The universe is loving you in all of your endeavors and and in that interaction experience where you you take a, a, a risk of doing something new and it sparks something new and growth in you, like you're saying, um, and it's growth and it's it's union and it's reunion. And it's really sweet. That's why I want women who, who read the book, contemplate on the book, to, to give themselves a chance to go off and have an experience that's totally and fully authentically theirs. They don't have to check in with anybody else about it. Over time, and especially if you're healing or trying to build up the sense of self-love in yourself to get out of a codependent loop or if you're in a relationship that's taking away from the better parts of you, however temporarily it does in time, the more confidence and love in yourself that you build up, the stronger and more stable you're going to be in yourself. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be this exotic adventure travel in a for, like in Thailand or 
hanging off the, you know, the lip of a cliff or anything. But the more experiences like that that you're able to have where you feel your embodied responses to things, you are in communication with your team, you're in communication with the earth, you are going to be so much healthier and and able to field the curveballs that life throws at you. And with that, Laura, I want to thank you for being on the show. This went so fast. It did. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. So if you'd oh like to know more about Laura and her work, her website is linked below. Remember to like, share, subscribe for more TV interviews. And until next time, bye, everyone. Bye, Althea. Thank you bye, so much. Bye,